So I know you've been into that kind of shit, like Alexander the Great. Yeah. And all the all the, the different conquerors, all these guys, yeah. Pippin, Charlemagne, Clovis. Now is this stuff that you just studied because you wanted to study conquerors? Does just interest you? I wanted to study that mindset. Fucking student of war. I know all the warriors from, in that, from Charlemagne, Achilles, the number one warrior of all warriors. From there, Alexander and Napoleon, I know them all. I read them all, I studied them all. That's why I'm so feared. That's why they feared me when I was in the ring. The ultimate knockout puncher. The ultimate knockout punch. Don't get hit by that. Don't get hit by that. <laughs> The Carolingian period, during which Charlemagne and his family held power, represents a great many things to a great many people, even those not typically interested in the Dark Ages. More often than not, it is seen as a beacon of civilization in a time of barbarism. But make no mistake, it would take more than a few barbaric acts to get there. More politically minded observers of this period have claimed that the Carolingian Empire prefigured today's European Union while others, more concerned with the past, but just as eager for sweeping historical narratives, have gone so far as to say that Charlemagne and his successors saved Western civilization by the skin of their teeth. All the life-giving human activities that we lump together under the word civilization have been obliterated once in Western Europe, when the barbarians ran over the Roman Empire. Uh, for two centuries, the heart of European civilization almost stopped beating. We got through by the skin of our teeth. These people have casted the Carolingians in two roles. The first as inheritors of the legacy of ancient Rome, and the second as innovators who pioneered feudalism, manorialism, and knighthood. In essence, the entire modus operandi of medieval Europe. That is why the founder of this empire, Charlemagne, is so often called the father of Europe. For the French and German people alike, He's a little bit like a medieval George Washington. But unlike Washington, Charlemagne was not just statesman and general. He was an empire builder living in a very different time, when might made right. There is no single battle or campaign that earned Charlemagne his place in history. No fight against overwhelming odds or swift toppling of another empire. Instead, Charlemagne's inclusion in the pantheon of military greats was earned through the scope and scale of his conquests, incremental as they were. It is a certain brand of sheer persistence and unending patience that forged Charlemagne's reputation as conqueror. That is the essence of why you hear as unlikely a source as Mike Tyson rank him alongside Alexander the Great and Napoleon. Historians will of course have their contentions, as they always do, but consider just for a moment the very matter of Charlemagne's name. In fact, it's not just a name, but a title also. Charlemagne comes from French and translates to Charles the Great. In German, it is Karl der Grosse, and in Latin, it is Carolus Magnus. That is the name we all know him by. So, whether you're a historian or Mike Tyson, every mention of the name Charlemagne is a kind of act of homage, whether we like it or not. On the topic of Charlemagne's name, Edward Gibbon, in his magnum opus, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, chimed in with his usual pithiness, saying, quote, The appellation of great has often been bestowed, and sometimes deserved, 
but Charlemagne is the only prince in whose favor the title has been indissolubly blended with the name." End quote. Those of you familiar with this period might have known all of this already. What is less appreciated is the fact that the Russian Karol, Polish Krol, and Czech and Slovak Kral, all meaning king, come from the Frankish name Karl, or Charles. The same is true in many other Slavic languages and even in Turkish. This speaks to the continent-spanning influence wielded by Charlemagne and the Carolingian family, with the territorial extent of their empire unparalleled in Western Europe since the days of ancient Rome. And like Rome, the Carolingian Empire was not built in a day. Before Augustus, there had been his great uncle, Julius Caesar, and the backdrop of the Roman Republic. Before Alexander the Great, there had been his father, Philip of Macedon, and the backdrop of classical Greece. And sure enough, before Charlemagne, there had been his father, Pepin the Short, and the backdrop of Merovingian Francia. His predecessors had kept the memory of ancient Rome alive, maybe on life support, but still alive. And don't let Pepin's nickname, the Short, fool you either. He was a warrior king in the mold of Clovis, and his reign was an active and productive one. It's just that, with Charles the Hammer as your father, and Charlemagne as your son, it's awfully difficult to not come out as the runt of the Carolingian litter. And yet, to understand how this family achieved all it did, we must understand the groundwork that Pepin had laid for his successors. That means we have to pick up exactly where we left off in the last episode, the year 751 AD, when Pepin finally deposed the Merovingian dynasty and ascended to the Frankish throne. Pepin was hailed as King of the Franks in the city of Soissons, where 250 years ago, Clovis, the first of the Frankish kings, had won his greatest victory against the remnants of Roman Gaul. Pepin is supposed to have had papal backing, but this may have been a later invention meant to retroactively justify the transition of power from the Merovingians to the Carolingians. According to the traditional story, while he was still palace mayor, and ostensibly bound in servitude to a Merovingian king, Pepin had addressed a letter to the Pope at the time, Pope Zachary, asking point-blank, quote, In regard to the kings of the Franks who no longer possess the royal power, is this state of things proper? End quote. To fully appreciate Pope Zachary's response, we have to understand where he was coming from. Pope Zachary is said to have been a smart cookie, with one historian calling him perhaps the most subtle and able of all the Roman pontiffs of this time. Because the papacy was in such a fraught position, all of Pope Zachary's gifts were required of him. The Lombards, who had displaced the Goths and established their own kingdom in northern Italy, eyed the seat of the papacy, the city of Rome, with hungry eyes. In this looming struggle, the Byzantines, ruling the eastern remnants of the Roman Empire from the city of Constantinople, would have been a natural ally. After all, Pope Zachary was Greek himself, and a long history existed between the papacy and the Roman Empire, which the Greek-speaking Byzantines claimed to be inheritors of, still referring to themselves as Romans. Yet, as the Byzantines lost their holdings in Italy and fell under the sway of iconoclasm, a Christian doctrine that opposed the worship of religious images, there was a cooling of relations between the Pope and the Byzantine Emperor. That meant that the papacy was in need of a new ally. And who better than the protagonists of our story, the Franks? This up-and-coming people were the logical choice for an alliance, and so Pope Zachary supposedly replied to Pepin's letter, giving him exactly what he wanted, his consent in deposing the Merovingians. Now, let's fast forward a couple of years later to 753 AD. Pope Zachary had died and been succeeded by Pope Stephen II. Neither as subtle nor as able as his predecessor, he failed to stop hostilities with the Lombards from breaking out. This prompted the Pope to make a public show of nailing the violated Lombard treaty to a crucifix. His next act was more subtle. He sent word to the newly enthroned Pepin that he was coming up north to pay him a visit. Wasting no time, Pope Stephen crossed the Alps that same year, his goal a simple one. Win Pepin to his side and get the Lombards off his back. At this point, a deal seems to have been struck between Pepin and the Pope. At the Basilica of Saint Denis in Paris, Pepin was crowned as king a second time, although this time 
It was by the Vicar of Christ himself, affording him new legitimacy and prestige. And since no one could say when there would be another occasion for the Pope to visit Paris, Pope Stephen also anointed Charlemagne and Carloman, Pepin's sons, as future kings of the Franks for good measure. He then named all three Carolingians Patricians of Rome, an honorific title that made them defenders of Italy and the Holy See. In doing so, Pope Stephen tacitly hoped to make the Carolingians honor-bound to defend the city of Rome from the Lombards. The impression was not lost on Pepin. This was the first time any pope had crossed the Alps, and it was also the first time that a pope had crowned a king, setting a double-edged precedent for later Carolingian rulers. And so, the die was cast. When spring came and the mountain passes of the Alps thawed, Pepin and his army set out, crossing the Mont Cenis and taking the same path that Hannibal had used to march on Rome. Unlike the ancient Romans, the Dark Age Lombards did not put up much of a fight. Instead, at sword point, they renewed their treaty with the papacy, even if they would renege on it yet again and besiege Rome the following year. This prompted a second Frankish retaliation campaign, which finally put the matter to rest, at least for now. The Lombards gave up hostages, agreed to pay annual tribute, and pledged to keep their hands off the eternal city of Rome. For his part, Pepin seems to have ceded control of either all or parts of newly conquered Ravenna, Spoleto, Benevento, and the Romagna to the papacy, lands that would form the core of the papal states. From this moment onward, the Pope would become more than a spiritual figure. In addition to being shepherds of men's souls, St. Peter's successors were now temporal rulers in their own right. It would take time for the papacy to capitalize on this change in fortunes, but eventually the Holy See of Rome would come to occupy a privileged place in the power struggles of the High Middle Ages and the Renaissance. As for Pepin, he spent the rest of his reign asserting control over southern France, a region that the Merovingians had long struggled to tame. As early as 752 AD, he had already marched down the Rhone Valley, bringing the local Visigoths to heel. Seven years after that, he uprooted the Muslim Umayyads after besieging their regional seat in Narbonne. In doing so, Pepin completed the project begun by his father, Charles Martel. It took Pepin another seven years to accomplish his conquest over all of Aquitaine. Seven years encompassing a brutal series of campaigns that left behind burnt villas, ruined vineyards, and abandoned monasteries. In the wake of this scorched earth policy, Gascony was also tamed, a region that even the ancient Romans struggled to assert control over. Like Charlemagne, Pepin had no Battle of Tours to his name, no climactic engagement that still has name recognition today. But what he did have was a military record unblemished by defeat. His campaigns during this period marked the start of a new type of warfare that the Franks would gradually perfect. A grueling slugfest that relied on fielding more men, more supplies, and better equipment in a prolonged effort to outlast their enemies and wear them down round by round, and pound for pound. However, Pepin didn't quite go the distance, because in 768, just when total victory seemed secure, Pepin dropped dead and was succeeded by his two sons, Charlemagne and Carloman. If you listened to the last episode, you probably know what's coming. Carolingians now and in the future would abide by the same succession law that the Merovingians devised, more or less equally partitioning a realm between the sons of a ruler upon his death. Up to this point, we know very little about Charlemagne's upbringing. He may have been born in Aachen, the city that would go down in history as the seat of his empire and the epicenter of the Carolingian Renaissance. However, there is a possibility that Charlemagne was instead born in Herstal, his family's ancestral home, or somewhere else entirely. Throughout the course of this episode, we will continue to refer to Charlemagne as such, despite the fact that this is long before anyone recognized him as great. Historians quibble about whether Charlemagne was born out of wedlock, as his birth seems to have occurred shortly before the marriage of his parents. As we shall see, the line between wives and concubines was still a surprisingly faint one. 
the Carolingian family's papal alliance notwithstanding. With regard to Charlemagne's joint rulership with his brother, Carloman, their two realms were technically not to be thought of as separate. Instead, they were to act and rule in unison. In practice, though, the idea of a joint inheritance was not very tenable. The two brothers were young, no doubt eager to prove themselves, and very often not in the same place. With the realm's territory carved up between them, they were bound to butt heads. Charlemagne was 26 years old at this time, and he received the northern lands, Neustria, western Aquitaine, and northern Austrasia, roughly corresponding to northern France. His little brother Carloman was nine years younger, only 17, and he received the southern lands, Septimania, Burgundy, Provence, Swabia, southern Austrasia, and eastern Aquitaine. The first test of the brothers' medal seems to have come very early, with the Aquitanians and Gascons not quite ready to throw in the towel now that their adversary, Pepin, had perished. This is where, already, Carloman breaks with Charlemagne, refusing to take part in the war. He left that burden entirely to Charlemagne. After Charlemagne was successful, things may have escalated between him and his brother had it not been for their mother, who tried to keep the peace between the two even if she seems to have favored Charlemagne. In a bid to consolidate his standing, she brokered a marriage alliance on his behalf with the Lombards, inflaming relations with both the Pope and Carloman, who being encircled geographically and outshone on the battlefield, must have felt the power balance shifting in Charlemagne's favor, even if he was to quickly abandon his Lombard wife. As fate would have it, there was no Merovingian-style showdown between Charlemagne and his brother, and that is because in 771 AD, Carloman inexplicably ups and dies. Surprisingly, no black legend haunts Carloman's death, despite how convenient it proved to Charlemagne. According to one explanation, Carloman died of a nosebleed which, if true, has got to make it probably the most important nosebleed in history. In any case, the sole rule of Charlemagne had begun, the start of a new era characterized by brains and brawn alike. Although there would be near constant warfare under Charlemagne's reign, there would also be great strides in administration, architecture, and learning alike, the dawn of what is known as the Carolingian Renaissance. In truth, the dichotomy of Charlemagne's reign was a feature, not a bug. Without the unbridled expansion, most of these advances would be either unnecessary or impossible. The accumulation of new land and subjugated peoples necessitated the development of new ways of governance and the influx of wealth made it possible to fund all manner of intellectual and civic ventures. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Before any of that, Charlemagne had to deal with the Lombards, who he had alienated by discarding his wife, and who now threatened the papacy yet again. Much like his father, Charlemagne decided to side with the Pope and take swift action against his oppressors. In his magisterial book, Heart of Europe, A History of the Holy Roman Empire, Peter Wilson writes, quote, the Papal Frankish alliance was renewed in 773 by Charlemagne, Pippin's eldest son, who answered renewed calls for assistance as the Lombards again tried to assert secular jurisdiction over Rome. The future emperor looked the part at 1.8 meters, about 5 foot 9, towering over his contemporaries, even if he was developing a pot belly from overeating. Detesting drunkenness and dressing modestly, Charlemagne nonetheless clearly enjoyed being the center of attention. Recent attempts to debunk him as a military leader are unconvincing. The Franks were simply the best organized for war of all the major post-Roman kingdoms, as Charlemagne amply demonstrated in his campaign to rescue the Pope in 773 to 774. End quote. The drums of war had sounded yet again, and their din would not easily diminish. For the next three or so decades, Charlemagne would lead an army into battle every single year. In this particular conflict against the Lombards, we find him and his army laying siege to their capital, the city of Pavia. Its defenders counted on the Franks being whittled down by the usual suspects, starvation and diseases like dysentery and malaria. In those days, besieging a fortification was sometimes just as dangerous as being besieged, if not more so. A besieging army had to contend not just with maladies and malnutrition, but also the perpetual threats of a garrison force's sally or a relief army's arrival. Nonetheless, the Franks were able to overcome these obstacles through their numbers and preparedness, 
Over centuries of conflict, both internal and external, they had acquired a knack for military organization and logistics, taking care of the little things, like bringing enough wine so that soldiers didn't catch dysentery drinking from local water sources. At this time, siege warfare was still in its infancy, and the stone walls encircling cities in Italy, Aquitaine, and Spain kept their inhabitants pretty safe. However, as early as the campaigns of Charles Martel and Pippin, we start to see the deployment of battering rams, rope ladders, and incendiary assaults. Although no siege engines were brought to bear against Pavia, the Franks were successful all the same, starving the Lombard capital into submission. It was at this moment that Charlemagne did something unprecedented. He did not content himself with collecting hostages, tribute, and pledges for peace like his father. Instead, Charlemagne seized the Lombard throne, and with it, the Iron Crown, which, according to popular legend, contained inside it a one centimeter wide band composed of a nail used in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. This sort of thing had not happened for two centuries. There had been plenty of battles, wars, and conquests in that stretch of time, but no ruler based in Western Europe had swallowed an entire kingdom outright. From the very start then, Charlemagne's appetites were greater than his predecessors. However, like them, he continued currying favor with his new neighbor, the Pope, confirming the territorial concessions made by his father. Despite the protracted siege of Pavia, the conquest of northern Italy had been swift and decisive, with future revolts summarily crushed and Frankish control reaching as far south along the Italian peninsula as Spoleto and Benevento, which enveloped the newly created Papal States. It's still unclear at this time what actually belonged to the Papal States and what belonged to the Franks as, in practice, the Pope had a limited ability to enforce his rule. Compared to the Lombards, Charlemagne tended to face more slippery foes in his other engagements, like for example in the Pyrenees mountain range separating France and Spain, where the Battle of Roncesvalles Pass was fought. This was an inglorious skirmish plucked almost randomly from the many campaigns of Charlemagne, turned into the set piece for one of the great masterpieces of medieval literature, the Song of Roland. In the lead up to the skirmish, Charlemagne was invited into Iberia by a Muslim ruler from whom he received homage in exchange for military support in 778. But in one of the few splotches on an otherwise pristine military record, Charlemagne's Spanish campaign was stymied. After unsuccessfully besieging the city of Saragossa in northeastern Spain, Charlemagne called it quits and led his army back home, only for the Frankish rearguard and baggage train to be ambushed and massacred in the mountain pass of Roncesvalles. It was probably Charlemagne's most embarrassing defeat, one that he would almost certainly have preferred everyone forget. Yet Charlemagne was one of those figures whose failures eclipsed other men's successes, and in one of those ironic twists that history sometimes produces, the skirmish would be endlessly recounted, reinvented, and retold right up to the present day. Long after this skirmish, the borderlands with Iberia were to be a battleground. Charlemagne did not return there, although he opted to send one of his sons, who was successful in solidifying control over a hotly contested buffer zone known as the Spanish March. And in case you're wondering, there are no comparable songs about these later endeavors. Charlemagne would come to rely more and more on his military commanders, often counts, and later his sons. Of the 18 known children that Charlemagne sired with his seven wives and concubines, three of his sons, Charles, Pepin, and Louis, seem to have been particularly eager and effective in advancing their father's project in empire building. These three sons would join their father on his campaigns and eventually mount their own, allowing the Franks to face multiple enemies at the same time. Splitting one's forces was highly uncommon during this period in history, but as the Franks pushed further in all directions, it became increasingly necessary. And nowhere was it more necessary than in the East, where the Franks faced enemies that they had long done battle with, but never so successfully as under Charlemagne, such peoples as the Saxons, Avars, and Slavs. As many as four Frankish armies were in the field at the same time, sometimes focused on different targets in the same region, and other times on a completely different enemy. As such, we see in some instances three or four armies at a time marching against the Saxons or the Avars, and in others, one army occupied with the Slavs, while another is engaged against the Saxons, for example. It was the incorporation of Bavaria, the southeastern expanse of Germany into the Frankish realm, 
that opened the door to further engagements in the east. The process began around the time of the conquest of Lombardy and culminated in the overthrow of the ruling dynasty in Bavaria, which had fostered close ties to the Merovingians and retained authority over their ancestral lands. Now, in 789, the Carolingians imposed their own rule in Bavaria, establishing counties and marches and appointing men they could trust to oversee them. This is when the Avars enter our story, a people with vague eastern origins that had, in the last two centuries, entrenched themselves in the Danube Basin in present-day Hungary. It is here we are told that they returned after their bountiful raids, resting and recuperating in ring-shaped forts that were filled to the brim with silver and gold, like some dragon's lair. The Avars were the latest in a long succession of eastern steppe tribes, with the Scythians and the Huns coming before them and the Magyars still to come. They had already terrorized the Byzantines even besieging Constantinople, and they had butted heads with the Franks as well, having been repelled from Bavaria by Dagobert I, one of the last Merovingian rulers to throw his weight around. Now, in Charlemagne's day, when the Avars thought to take advantage of Bavaria's change in ownership, their forces were repelled and sent packing back to Pannonia, where they were little more than sitting ducks. It was at this point that Charlemagne mounted his two-pronged Pannonian campaign, with the Avars' ring-shaped encampments standing no chance against the Franks. They had, after all, been used to grinding down more formidable stone fortifications in southern Europe. As with other campaigns, Charlemagne's attention was diverted elsewhere, and so members of his military cadre would complete it for him. He would return when the Avar Confederation lay in ruins. Their bounteous plunder seized, and their people prepared to pay homage to him. We will turn to our leading narrator of this time to paint a picture of this considerable transfer of wealth from the Avars to the Franks. The name of this narrator is Einhard, and he is to the Carolingians what Gregory of Tours was to the Merovingians. Einhard refers to the Avars as the Huns, much like the Byzantines did. Funnily enough, the Huns had once been referred to as the Scythians, and if you're wondering whether one day another of these hordes would be referred to as the Avars, you would be correct. Such is the human need for giving things and people recognizable names. In any case, Einhard says this about the plunder that the Franks expropriated. Quote, the memory of man cannot recall any war waged against the Franks by which they were so much enriched and their wealth so increased. Up to this time, they were regarded almost as a poor people. But now, so much gold and silver were found in the palace such precious spoils were seized by them in their battles, that it might be fairly held that the Franks had righteously taken from the Huns what they unrighteously had taken from other nations." End quote. In other words, if you're plundering a plunderer, you get a pass, which the Franks got often. During the early Middle Ages, and much of human history in general, raiding was a constant. It wasn't just the bread and butter of steppe hordes and Vikings. Administrative advances under Merovingian and Carolingian rule notwithstanding, the major engine of wealth seems to have been raiding. Taxation and tribute were increasingly important, but there was still raiding. That being said, Frankish conquests sometimes yielded more than just plunder. They could, for example, yield a fresh ally in the struggle against a new enemy. This is more or less what happened with the Slavs, who more readily accepted Charlemagne's authority after he seized control over tribal lands belonging to the Croatian, Bohemian, and Moravian peoples. The Slavs went on to become important allies to Charlemagne in his three-decade-long struggle against a far less pliant people, the Saxons. More than any other conflict, the Saxon Wars were the ultimate test for the Frankish war machine. The Saxons inhabited a densely forested expanse of land in northern Germany, their division into different tribes making them all the more difficult to subdue. In the preceding centuries, the Franks had attempted to proselytize these people, and their attempts were unsuccessful. The Saxons continued worshipping their pagan gods and mounting raids on their neighbors, even venturing so far as the British Isles, where enough of them settled down to gradually form a new Anglo-Saxon cultural identity. The war with the Saxons was a very different story from the war with the Lombards, whose lands were taken in a single campaign by Charlemagne. By comparison, it would take Charlemagne 18 campaigns to subdue the Saxons, some of them undertaken in the winter. Not even the grueling war in southern France could compare in terms of bloodshed and viciousness. As a result, the Franks had to throw everything they had against their dogged, hydra-like enemies. 
pitched battles were ineffective, so we see the establishment of garrison defenses, the simultaneous deployment of multiple armies, the organization of winter campaigns, in addition to frequent raids, massacres, and deportations, all undertaken to crush the Saxon spirit. Charlemagne's early issuance of a legal code that condemned any Saxon pagan worship to death escalated things past the point of no return. Among other things, the code delineated 34 new laws, outlawing human sacrifice and making the consumption of meat during Lent punishable by death. This gets at a major motivation for the Saxon Wars. Because of the cynicism of the modern age, we too easily dismiss religious pretexts for wars as justifications for grabbing more land and loot. But this was more than just that. The author of the Song of Roland made an attempt to present Charlemagne's Iberian struggle as a prototype of the Crusades. But the real prototypical crusade, characterized by all the fury and certainty of purpose endowed by religious devotion, was fought in Saxony. Historian Bernard Schultz, in his preface to Einhard's Carolingian Chronicles, puts it well, saying, quote, Frankish exploits and victories are accompanied by miracles in the Chronicles, and phrases like, by the will of God, with the help of God, God frustrated their intentions, and how much the power of God worked against them for the salvation of the Christians, nobody can tell, seem to indicate that, to this analyst, the Saxon campaign is almost a holy war to increase the kingdom of God. End quote. That is why the single most brutal act of Charlemagne's reign was overlooked or justified by his chroniclers. The act is known to us today as the Massacre of Verdun, the mass execution of 4,500 Saxon prisoners by decapitation. Somehow, the Saxons kept fighting on for more than 20 years after this massacre, before at long last they were pacified. One day, long after they had been Christianized and brought into the fold, the Saxons would have the last laugh, placing one of their own on the throne of the Holy Roman Empire. The conquest had another unintended consequence. It awoke a sleeping giant in the form of the Vikings. In the public imagination, much is misunderstood about the people who were given this designation. The Vikings belonged to a Germanic ethno-linguistic group known as the Norse, the distant ancestors of the modern Danes, Swedes, and Norwegians. The term Viking was initially used as a verb to describe the act of pillaging. Therefore, initially one was not referred to as a Viking, but instead one would say that he was going Viking. Later, the term was extended to refer to these raiders directly. As I mentioned, the Norse were a Germanic people, thought to share a common heritage with the Franks, Goths, Saxons, and others. As such, the chief god of their pantheon, Odin, had once been worshipped by people settling further south, including the Saxons, Lombards, and others, even if they knew him by a different name, not Odin, but Woden, or another linguistic variant. As one might imagine, then, when the Franks conquered and Christianized the lands of the Woden-worshipping Saxons, the Norse people may have worried that they were next on the chopping block. Up to this point, the Norse had actually been far more engaged in the European economy than most people realize. As early as 700, a thriving North Sea trade linked the peoples of Scandinavia, Eastern England, and Francia. Centers of trade and industry were built in these places to facilitate the exchange of production of precious commodities, the biggest of them located in Francia. The Franks exported wine and high-quality pottery made in the Rhineland, already in those days showing a precocious craftsmanship that its inhabitants would become famous for during the Industrial Revolution. The Scandinavians, meanwhile, exported amber and ivory, probably from the tusks of walruses, and the Anglo-Saxons exported cloaks. Trades like metalworking, glassworking, basket weaving, boat building, and textile working all came to be practiced at the Emporia. However, because the Emporia were undefended, they were some of the first targets for the Vikings in the later 9th century. But we're getting ahead of ourselves again. In the days of Charlemagne, the Norse were still on the back foot, so much so that in the year 808, the Danish king at that time had an earthen dike extended so that it stretched 30 kilometers long across the strait. This was the type of defensive rampart that we see springing up in other parts of Europe immediately after Rome's collapse especially by those people who felt threatened, like those in the British Isles. Probably not manned around the clock like Hadrian's Wall or other Roman frontier defenses, 
This Danish rampart was likely useful all the same, not just in the event of an impending attack, but also for staging raids against unsuspecting neighbors. We know that the same Danish king who extended this rampart mounted at least one such raid into Frisia, from where he supposedly planned to march on Aachen, the Carolingian capital. He was assassinated before he had the chance to do so, but in the lead-up to the fight, Charlemagne, now in his 60s, personally took the field and oversaw the construction of naval defenses on the North Sea coast. It was Charlemagne's only brush with a people that, in the words of one historian, was almost unknown to his ancestors, but destined to be only too well known to his sons. Now, having surveyed the many battles, campaigns, and wars of Charlemagne's reign, we should take a moment to pause and ask the question that the military historians in the room would be clamoring to pose right about now. How did Charlemagne do it? How did he and his armies repeatedly triumph against so many different foes across the European continent? We've already touched on a few points of military strategy, tactics, and equipment, but we haven't explored any of these topics in detail, nor have we really nailed down the essence of what set the Franks apart, even if their trump card has been hinted at. So let's give away the secret sauce. What set the Franks apart was their mastery of logistics, which boiled down to sweating the little stuff. This enabled them to make full use of their advantages in population and material. Without due regard for the principles of military organization and planning, none of Charlemagne's conquests would have been possible, his many advantages notwithstanding. This analysis differs from the traditional narrative that we have been given to explain Carolingian dominance on the battlefield. According to this outdated narrative, it was the cavalry revolution beginning with Charles Martel and occasioned by the advent of the stirrup which made the Franks so unbeatable. Eventually, this explanation was taken even further to account for the origins of feudalism, its basis being that the practitioners of these new cavalry tactics formed the core not only of the Carolingian army, but also the nobility, as the military service they rendered was reciprocated with hereditary lands and titles. There's more to this explanation, but for the most part it has buckled under the weight of modern scrutiny. Although the stirrup was introduced to Europe by the Avars as early as the 6th century, the Franks only seemed to have adopted it in the late 8th century, and even after that, it was an incremental process. Artists in the late 9th century still sometimes depicted horsemen with no stirrups, which would probably not be the case if this revolution was as sweeping as has been claimed. Furthermore, as far as we can tell, the core of the Carolingian nobility descended from the same people that held power during the reign of the Merovingians the Carolingians themselves simply being the most successful of these peers. Fine, you may contend, but doesn't the traditional narrative still hold up? After all, furnishing a horse, stirrups, armor, and weapons was expensive, and it would make sense for the well-off to be the ones to capitalize on this revolution in cavalry tactics, thereby securing their hold on power. This is a reasonable contention. However, the truth is that there simply was no revolution in this aspect of early medieval warfare. Stirrups did present certain advantages, like helping riders mount their horses, enabling them to stand in their stirrups to perform more effectively mid-combat, and also allowing them to ride light during long journeys, their butts being better off for it. While useful, none of these advantages constitute a revolution, as has been claimed by those whose thesis was that the stirrup led to the development of shock cavalry. The logic being that the stirrup, which helped prevent riders from falling off their horses, gave them sufficient stability to wield long lances that could be couched, or held under the arm, to perform a devastating shock charge. This, it has been argued, then led to the development of a shock cavalry force, and eventually knights and nobles, QED. In reality, the stirrup alone did not enable the advent of shock cavalry. That development would come during the end of the Carolingian period, when we see improvements being made to the saddle to further affix a rider in place, and then later, the arrival of the first knights. With all that cleared up, we can now turn our attention to what actually made Charlemagne's army so successful. Much of it has to do with Charlemagne, one of the most tireless war planners in all of medieval history. The historian Guy Hossol, in his book Warfare and Society in the Barbarian West, has this to say about Charlemagne. Quote, Charlemagne seems to have taken an unusual interest in the supplying of his army, especially after 800. Earlier, he set out in some detail how the resources of the royal estates were to be harnessed to support his armies. Notably, the estates were to provide carts carrying 12 measures of wine, 
and 12 measures of flour. The carts were to be capable of being floated across rivers and were to come with a shield, lance, and a bow and arrows for the attendants to defend themselves. Those utensils that might be required by the army were also to be kept in a locked storeroom at the center of each royal estate. The carts were to carry flour, wine, bacon, and victuals in abundance, along with whetstones, stone-cutting tools, axes, augers, and slinging machines, and there were to be men who could use these. Stones for the slinging machines were to be carried on pack animals." End quote. Now let's not kid ourselves, a lot of this was most likely ignored by the guys on the ground. It's hard to seriously entertain the notion that every estate in Charlemagne's empire showed up on campaign with exactly 12 measures of wine and 12 measures of flour neatly laid out in their cart. This gets at something we can call the enforcement problem. It's something all pre-modern empire builders faced. Rulers lacked the means to enforce many of their orders, especially when dealing with those who showed up to do battle in their names. Since the Merovingians, the rulers of the Franks exercised something called the banum, a word of Germanic origin that encapsulated the right to call freemen to battle. The banum, or effectively right to rule, would be extended under the Carolingians starting with Charlemagne. Nonetheless, the transition from followers to subjects was not yet complete, so Charlemagne and his administrators had to do a lot of pushing and persuading to get things done. Because of the enforcement problem, they couldn't push too hard though, especially when it came to their army of followers slowly getting used to the idea of being oath-bound subjects. That would mean alienating the backbone of their power. And it was not just the means that they lacked, but the information necessary to enforce their rulings. This is another pre-modern phenomenon, the information problem. This is before the cell phone, telegraph, and printing press, and so the dissemination of information proceeded at a much slower pace. New rules and regulations were slow to be transmitted, and rule breakers slow to be routed out and punished. We will continue exploring these problems and how Charlemagne sought to overcome them in the next episode, which will focus more on the civic and administrative aspects of his reign. For now, it suffices to say that Charlemagne was simply one of those restless spirits ahead of his time, impatient with the constraints imposed by space, time, and nature. This was, after all, long before man had any hope of becoming suzerain of the earth, still believing dragons to reside in the wings of the world. Back when, unlike dragons, the all too real forces of pestilence, plague, floods, and earthquakes played an outsized role in mankind's story. Nonetheless, Charlemagne vied for mastery over men and natural forces alike. Returning to Bernard Schultz's preface to Einhard, he says, quote, The intrepid Charlemagne seems as oblivious of physical obstacles as he is impatient with political opponents. In one year, he builds two bridges over the Elba and fortifies one of them by bulwarks of wood and earth at both ends. With a movable bridge of pontoons connected by anchors and ropes, he makes the Danube passable. He attempts to construct a canal between Altbiel and Rednitz, which would allow him to travel by ship from the Rhine into the Danube. On the coast of the North Sea, he builds a fleet and restores a lighthouse. These are interesting efforts but they cannot conceal that ambitions and designs far outstrip technical knowledge and expertise." End quote. More than the Franks' wide-ranging conquests against foreign peoples, it is their attempted pacification of the forces of nature that bind them in spirit to the ancient Romans, whose engineers and quartermasters uncomplainingly made the conquests of their generals possible in the first place. Although his presence on the battlefield was no doubt inspirational, as is the case when any leader puts skin in the game, the soft-spoken Charlemagne seems at times to have most in common with the crowd of engineers and quartermasters diligently working behind the scenes. Even if Charlemagne had to contend with the enforcement and information problems we discussed earlier, that did not stop him from making the attempt, without which nothing is achieved whatsoever, either on or off the battlefield. And sure enough, Charlemagne's repeated attempts do seem to have allowed his armies to show up to the battlefield with consistently greater numbers, better equipment, and with more provisions, even during the winter season which was meant for rest and recuperation. Unlike the cities in the Italian peninsula, where three quarters of ancient towns still thrived in the 10th century with their original Roman street plains, 
the lands north of the Alps had precious little infrastructure to build upon. What roads existed were often impassable in the winter, and river crossings equally hazardous. Nonetheless, Charlemagne had bridges and collapsible boats built to make river crossings possible where there were no roads. He also ensured that provisions were carefully stewarded and only consumed at designated points in the campaign route. The familiarity with these routes arising from their repeated usage in the Franks' many wars is what made this possible in the first place, as the maps of this time could not be relied upon. In regard to the provisioning of food and equipment, Charlemagne ordered that armies pack three months of food, six months of weapons and clothing, along with herds of animals and important tools necessary for the upkeep of their equipment. Again, this was the attempt, and you can bet that we have plenty of evidence of people not showing up with enough equipment, or not showing up at all. We even have cases of medieval draft dodging, with people entering church life or bribing local officials to get out of fighting. Nonetheless, the proof in the pudding is that the Franks under Charlemagne were able to bring most of these wars to a successful conclusion and impose their demands in such a way that the Merovingians could only dream of, even if, in the case of the Saxons, it would take three decades and 18 all-season campaigns to get there. Horses, which are so often associated with the Carolingian legend, played a decisive role in all of this, but not in the way most people think. For all the misconceptions about the stirrup, the Franks did have a formidable cavalry force, with the well-off bringing multiple horses and grooms on campaign. Although horses were not armored, they bore harnesses adorned with gold, silver, and bronze accoutrements, while others had their bridles fitted with boar tusks that must surely have given them an otherworldly impression from afar. Like some apocalyptic pack of corrupted unicorns with twisted horns, camouflaged in the snow, and come to tame the virgin lands of northern Europe. As for these steeds' riders, we know that they were skilled with sword and spear, which was used both as lunging weapon and projectile. After spending years on end campaigning and hunting, these mounted warriors must have been very comfortable in the saddle. Like a bike rider making a handless turn, Frankish horsemen probably got used to controlling their horses with their knees to increase their maneuverability mid-combat. But horses were not just useful as battle mounts, they were also vehicles for the transportation of critical provisions. It is horses and other beasts of burden that allowed Charlemagne's armies to be as large and mobile as they were. At one point during an expedition against the Avars, many of the horses died due to an outbreak of disease, delaying the outcome of the war another two years because of the need to resupply. A testament to the importance of these beasts of burden as far as the mobilization of men and material was concerned. At this time, Frankish armies reached as great a number as 12,000 men concentrated at a single point in space and time. Just so you know, Frankish troop counts are fiercely debated to this day, and the average army may have been closer in number to five to 6,000 men. One figure frequently cited in the past is 20,000 men, but that would make such an army four times the size of Paris at this time and therefore much too high. One historian has joked that the claims made for Carolingian capacity and efficiency would be enough to make 19th century Prussian generals jealous. That being said, the Franks were able to field multiple armies simultaneously, meaning the number of fighting men they commanded was considerable, perhaps rivaling that of the Byzantines. Theirs was the only other contemporary European empire, and it is believed that they also maxed out at 12,000 men at any given point. In terms of mobility, and we're guessing here, Frankish armies moved at a speed of perhaps 5 to 10 miles per day, taking into account those two constants in these sorts of equations, baggage trains and camp followers, i.e. attendants, merchants, bishops, and other non-combatants. To prevent unnecessary waste and inefficiency, new disciplinary measures were undertaken which probably had a positive effect on mobility. In an act that earned Charlemagne his reputation as teetotaler, drunkenness was strictly forbidden, the seizure of goods from friendly territory was met with fines or thrashings, and desertions carried the death penalty. In terms of the weapons Frankish warriors carried, we find them clad with swords, axes, spears, bows, and sea axes, basically long knives that were great as sidearms. Swords were long, straight, double-edged, pattern welded, and used for cutting and lunging alike. 
similar to the Roman spatha and distinct from the gladius, great for close quarter lunging instead. Frankish swords were less effective up close and might have been more intended for cavalry usage. They were considered valuable and expensive objects. Though we find a fair few of them in burial sites dating back to the 6th century, these finds may tell us more about the importance of burial practices as opposed to the relative value of these weapons. Axes were another favored Frankish weapon since the 6th century, and then made an even bigger comeback during the Viking Age. As the listeners of the last episode will know, the axe frequently appears as the weapon of choice for Clovis and the Merovingians. There is a popular myth that double-headed axes were used at this time, but we find no record of such, only battle axes and throwing axes. Of all these weapons, spears were the most ubiquitous, with significant variance in shape, size, and usability. Basically, all Frankish warriors, mounted and dismounted, had at least one spear, which could be used for throwing, lunging, and even slashing like the later halberd. Later, spears developed decorative wing-like protrusions placed near the tip. In the past, we used to think that that was because these wings were effective both on the battlefield where they prevented one spear from getting lodged in an enemy's body, and on the hunting ground where they could stymie the charge of wild beasts. In reality, these wings were probably ineffective in both those scenarios, and at most, useful against pinning enemies' blades. In terms of protection, the round and oval-shaped shield is almost universal during this period, right up to the Viking Age. Since we've already established that this age predates medieval knights, the famous knightly kite shield would come later. Since the Merovingians, Franks wore male and lamellar body armor composed of iron. Lamellar was actually easier and cheaper to make than male, and more common than people think. But those who couldn't afford iron equipment at all resorted to boiled or padded leather armor instead. The often cited figure for the price of a warrior's equipment is given at 40 solidi, a late Roman coin that remained in use as an accounting unit until the Carolingian leave. For that price, you got a full kit consisting of helmet, body armor, sword, spear, round shield, horse, and harness. To give some sense of how high that figure was, we can take the price of a cow which cost one solidus. So basically, a full kit sets you back 40 cows, the equivalent of 20 oxen and 4 horses. Charlemagne ruled as early as 792 that the well-off among the Franks were required to show up with a full kit, and about a decade after that, he ensured that this same class furnished their followers with spears, shields, bows, and 12 arrows each. Eventually, this seems to have taken a toll on the Frankish economy, prompting Charlemagne to ban the export of armor and weapons. All this information gives us some sense of the inner workings of the Frankish war machine. Although Charlemagne gets credit for tinkering with this machine and switching it to high gear, the engine, chassis, and transmission had already been put in place by Pepin, Charles Martel, and the Merovingians. Gibbon reaches a similar conclusion, saying, quote, The sedentary reader is amazed by Charlemagne's incessant activity of mind and body, and his subjects and enemies were not less astonished at his sudden presence, at the moment when they believed him at the most distant extremity of the empire. Neither peace nor war, nor summer nor winter, were a season of repose, and our fancy cannot easily reconcile the annals of his reign with the geography of his expeditions. But this activity was a national rather than a personal virtue. The vagrant life of a Frank was spent in the chase, in pilgrimage, in military adventures, and the journeys of Charlemagne were distinguished only by a more numerous train and a more important purpose. His military renown must be tried by the scrutiny of his troops, his enemies, and his actions. Alexander conquered with the arms of Philip, but the two heroes who preceded Charlemagne bequeathed him their name, their example, and the companions of their victories. At the head of his veteran and superior armies, he oppressed the savage nations who were incapable of confederating for their common safety. Nor did he ever encounter an equal antagonist in numbers, in discipline, or in arms. The science of war has been lost and revived with the arts of peace, but his campaigns are not illustrated by any siege or battle of singular difficulty and success, and he might behold with envy the Saracen trophies of his grandfather. After the Spanish expedition, his rearguard was defeated in the Pyrenean Mountains, 
and the soldiers whose situation was irretrievable and whose valor was useless might accuse with their last breath the want of skill or caution of their general. End quote. In the long century beginning in 714 AD and ending in 814 AD, Frankish annals record only seven years of peace. It had been a century of non-stop war and conquest, although the Franks had come out as masters of the continent in that time. The only question now was, how much more fuel did the machine have left in the tank? <laughs>